thank you very much. And I am indeed here to talk to you about breast cancer surgery and post-operative pain from the anaesthetist or the anesthesiologist perspective. I do have a few disclosures, none of which will impact on my ability to deliver this talk. Um, and I just here is a reminder of the hashtag to use if you are going to be tweeting. I've got to say from the outset, it's really great to be back at, our, at ISURA. Um, I was very fortunate in 2006, I came here as a delegate and I got to meet Professor Chan for the first time. And in 2016, 10 years later, he asked me back as faculty. So I really do love being associated with ISURA and I do love Canada. During the rest of this talk, I will cover why me? Surgical encounters, my patient encounters, my anaesthetic concerns, and some of my anaesthetic strategies. So to start off with, why am I talking about this topic? Well, I've been very lucky in that I've had some excellent teachers during my training, both with John McDonnell and Rafa Blanco teach me the paravertebral and the pex blocks in the early stage of my career. And I have been a breast anaesthetist for about 12 years. And during that period of time, I've been very fortunate. I've been able to teach a number of people and I've also managed to collaborate and produce some papers with some notable Canadians. So let's start off by talking about my initial surgical encounters. When I first started doing breast lifts, I did encounter some surgeons who said that breast surgery just isn't that painful. And once I started doing blocks with them for a while and we got some good results, they selected patients that they really felt they should benefit from having a block. However, as the day gets on, sometimes they turn around and say to me, we haven't got time for a block or don't worry, I'll put some local anesthetic in at the end. And of more concern, occasionally they have said to me that, you know what, the block that you put in the axilla, that really inf interfered with my surgery. And we've worked over time to, to work out those situations where that may be the case. And now mo more often than not, they're happy with those blocks. But if we were to think about how to address the surgical mindset, we need to you know, remember that we're working as part of a team and discuss the concerns that my surgical colleagues might have. And we always put the patient first. So if I think the patient will benefit, I'll discuss it with my surgical colleagues and we'll come up with a plan and select the cases where a block is likely to be beneficial. What about patient encounters? Often when I see a patient on the morning of surgery, as we often do in the United Kingdom, the surgeons want, the patients, sorry, will want to know whether the, the surgery is going to be painful and they have anxiety about how painful the surgery will be. When I discuss a block, the next thing they ask is, is the block going to hurt? They quite rightly want to know what the risks of the block are and whether or not they have to have it. Um, and I have had some patients say, well, this is all very well, but after 24 to 40 hours when the block wears off, then what happens? I do have a proportion of patients, the majority of my patients have surgery with block plus a general anaesthetic and they have concerns about whether they'll wake up in the middle of the, of the surgery or whether they will in fact wake up at the end of surgery. And some of them will even ask whether they need to have a general anaesthetic at all. So when I'm speaking to my patients, I try to make sure I give them as much information as possible and that I have time to do this, which isn't always easy in the morning of an operating list. Uh, I want the patient to be prepared as possible and feel reassured by that preoperative consultation. And therefore they have all the options in front of them and they play a role in that shared decision-making. How about anaesthetic concerns? Clearly we need to know about the relevant anatomy and therefore be able to decide which blocks are relevant. I need to think whether the patient will, pre will be prepared to accept the block or whether the surgeon will be happy. I need to know whether there are any contraindications and also to have that very obvious risk benefit discussion and have a backup plan if things don't go according to plan. I'm now going to spend the rest of the talk talking about the anaesthetic concerns. So let's start off with anatomy and innovation. It's not just as simple as T2 to T6 or T2 to T5, however you want to split up the innovation of the chest, there's a lot more to it. We've got to think about skin and subcutaneous innovation, but also innovation to the muscle and fascia. And that's where the pectoral nerves come in, as well as the thoracodorsal and long thoracic, and the intercostals of course play a role here. We also need to think about where the surgery is going to be in relation to the breast tissue and the nerves around it. Antromedial surgery involves the anterior cutaneous branches of the intercostals. Lateral and inferior quadrant surgery involves the lateral cutaneous branches. And you can see the relation to the serratus muscle, the pec muscles. And also as we come around to the back, you can see where you might be able to access the paravertebral space and other blocks from a certain aspect of the chest. The other thing we need to think about is the spectrum of surgery. And I'm just looking here at the oncological surgery that we'll be doing. 
we've got the straightforward wide local excision or lumpectomy or standard mastectomy. And then we've got oncoplastic versions of that where you couple it with a reconstruction, either implant or autologous, or you mobilize tissue to minimize the side, the, side, the chance of a defect. And all of these surgeries can of course be done in addition to auxiliary surgery, be that the slightly less painful sentinel node biopsy or the slightly more invasive auxiliary node dissection. Now let's talk about the bit that we all want to know. This is the nerve blocks. So I'm not going to be talking about thoracic epidural because very few of us do that for breast surgery now. But let's start off with the obvious paravertebral. So the paravertebral block there. We've got the pex block with both the interpectoral and subpectoral endpoints there. We've got a serratus anterior plane block, both the deep and superficial endpoints. The serratus intercostal fascial plane block, which is similar endpoint to the serratus plane. And then we've got a couple of the parasternal intercostal plane blocks, the pector intercostal fascial block and the transversus thoracis plane block, the ESP, the retrolamina and the MTP, and of course the rhomboid intercostal. So that's quite a few blocks to think about. And we often talk about the ESP, uh, the retrolamina and the MTP may be acting as paravertebral by proxy or paravertebral light blocks. The other way I like to think about the blocks is to break them up into their areas. So we've got the central neuraxial or paraneuraxial blocks. We've got the paraspinal plane blocks here, the anterolateral chest wall blocks, the anteromedial chest wall blocks, and the posterior lateral chest wall blocks. And again, in terms of what do I do practically, let's mix those all up again. I think about them in this sort of orientation. So I normally do the paravertebral or an ESP slash MTP block and or some of the more anterolateral, anteromedial fascial plane blocks. So how do you choose a block? Well, I think you've got to think about where which patients are going to benefit from a block and whether there's going to be any contraindications. As I said, you think about the incision location, whether the axilla is involved or not. And if the axilla is involved in an axillary node dissection, for me, that always means that I add in a PEX block. Whether they're using anticoagulants, because that will rule out certain blocks, and whether the surgeon will be accepting of local anesthetic in the axilla. But also we need to think about whether the patient's going to actually be able to position themselves into the position you want them for block insertion. So what do I do? For lumpectomy or minor surgery, I generally do either a PEX or serratus or ESP or MTP, depending on what I think the patient will benefit the most from. For mastectomy and reconstruction, I definitely do paravertebrals. And whenever I see the word auxiliary node dissection, I always add in a PEX too. So what about when we do this preoperative visit? It's really important that you're prepared and the patient is prepared. So I try to take my time and to reassure the patient, explain exactly what I'm going to be doing. And I use positive phrasing or language and I make a really concerted effort to do that because that really sets the tone. It's also important that the patient feels I'm confident in what I'm doing uh, and, they, and they know exactly what to expect when they come into the anaesthetic room. What about the technique of block insertion itself? It's again, it's important to set the scene. So I make sure that they've got a warm blanket when they come into the room or the block area. If I can, I like to play music or just to create that relaxing atmosphere. I'm very obvious about the way that my body language is. With a, with a mask, it's slightly more difficult to smile, but I do try and smile and make sure that they feel reassured and they're calm. And I try to exhibit compassion. Of course, you need to establish IV access and put full monitoring on. And then you use sedatious, sedation if required and make sure you position the patient with care and please do use local anaesthetic to the skin. When you're gonna give your general anaesthetic for these cases, you've got to use what you're comfortable with. I have been using a lot of propofol total intravenous anesthesia. I don't use remifentanil. Uh, I do use it in conjunction with a depth of anesthesia monitor. And at certain points where I know there's gonna be enhanced surgical stimulation, for example, washing the chest wall with betadine, at that stage, I always increase the depth of anesthesia to account or to account for the potential for there to be more nociception. I also use this in conjunction with multimodal analgesia and make sure I prescribe res rescue analgesia and discharge medications. We do need to talk about general anesthesia free surgery because I think if you can offer that option, you should offer the option to the patient. But it does require patient motivation because it's a different circumstance from, from being awake, from being asleep, sorry, of course. Um, you need to make sure the team and the surgeon are prepared for the differences in anesthesia. And you need to allow time for the block to work. And now I make sure I test the block before I take the patients through. 
And when the patient goes into theatre, you can use sedation. If you do, you monitor the depth of sedation and use a carbon dioxide or entitled CO2 monitor. Um, and I often combine this with using music and I found the patients find this quite relaxing. But it is important that you have a rescue strategy and a backup plan. And my preferred technique for this technique is to use paravertebral plus pecs. And if you search that hashtag, you will see lots of reference to that. What about once it's all finished, you've got to think about the post-operative visit. And the reason that's important because you need to find out how comfortable the patient is and whether they've required opioid requirement and whether or not you need to intervene and perform a rescue block. It's important to see whether there's um, an improvement in nausea and vomiting. I need to know what their quality of recovery is like and it's useful to start to measure outcome measures. So what are the outcome measures that are important? We've got the classical outcome measures, drinking, eating, analgesia and mobilising, but there's a whole host of other things that could be important. What's important to the patient? Or how do we assess the impact of our blocks? What we really would be nice to know would be the minimum clinically important difference in analgesic dose or in um, uh, in pain scores, but also, and that and that is defined as the smallest change that is important to patients, but also it'd be important to know with regards to quality of recovery, and we could use the, the measure of quality of recovery 15 and work out what is the minimum clinically important difference in quality of recovery scores, that that's another way of assessing our impact of blocks on the patient. But let's put this all into context. So this is a study, um, that was looking at a US registry from 20, 2010 to 2018, they managed to get complete data on 188,000 cases. Um, now of those cases, uh, only 14% of them had a mastectomy and the vast majority of them were uh, received a lumpectomy or a wide local excision. What was really interesting is of those cases that had a mastectomy, only 2.8% had blocks and 0.3% had blocks in the lumpectomy group. Now, when you have a look at uh, a graph of um, probability of receiving a block over time, you'll see 20, 2014 was a real flexion point. That was a tipping point. From that point onwards, more and more of the mastectomy started to have blocks, but it still represents a very small proportion of all of the patients having surgery. So now let's have a look at paravertebral blocks and quality of recovery. There's a couple of papers here, one from 2011 and one from 2014, that showed that paravertebral blocks were associated with a higher quality of recovery compared to GA alone. And also paravertebral with profile together were associated with a higher quality of recovery. So there's evidence here that paravertebral blocks make a difference. What about PEX2 blocks and quality of recovery? Here's a paper from 2020, and they compared PEX blocks against local infiltration they discovered that there was no difference in quality of recovery for minor surgery, but no, out of the 140, 104 patients, only 12 of them had a mastectomy. So maybe local infiltration is sufficient for the smaller surgeries. This is a paper from 2021, looking at the quality of recovery scores comparing deep serratus anterior plane versus a sham block. Uh, and actually what they noticed was there was no difference in quality of recovery, but again, this was for minor surgery. Now, is this the whole picture? I don't think it is. Um, so this year we published our experience of 100 breast surgical patients having surgery and we uh, at Guy's and St. Thomas's and we measured their pre and their post operative uh, quality of recovery scores. What was interesting when you looked at no block and then the addition of a block, certainly the quality of recovery scores increased when you added in a block. And the blocks that made the biggest difference were paravertebral blocks and a combination of techniques which had a significant impact on improving the quality of recovery. So if you have a look, paravertebral and combination blocks have a higher quality of recovery compared with no blocks, uh, and the combination blocks were higher than paravertebral, they had the biggest impact. So what were the combination blocks? Well, the majority were an erect spinal plane block plus an intertransverse or an MTP injection. So I basically, what I call um, a supercharged ESP, I do a standard ESP block and then advance the needle further into the intertransverse space to sort of enhance the quality of the block that we get at that one level. Now, is that a viable option? Uh, so in terms of what we should do going forward with regional anesthesia for breast surgery, we do have some guidance from the prospect group, and they said that we should be giving multimodal analgesia. We should use gabapentin. We don't do that at my centre. They recommended using IV dexamethasone. 
and opioids as rescue only. Uh, and they said that paravertebral should be first choice and PEC should be second choice. And they said you can add surgical infiltration to all of this. Now, this uh, sort of generated some controversy in the literature, but it is some guidance that is out there for you. So let me summarize. It's important that you listen to your patient give them all the information they require, work with your surgeons to make sure you come up with a plan that they're happy with. At the very least, you should use local infiltration and measure quality of recovery. But clearly I feel there is a benefit for regional anesthesia here. But with regional anesthesia, we can make a difference. And here is a, a selection of some of the patients that I've anesthetized who have given me permission to share their images. Uh, and this last one was a tweet that came out very recently. I have permission of the, uh, of the owner of the tweet. Um, this was a patient of mine who uh, remembered me on their five year mastectomy anniversary because of the impact of regional anesthesia. So a big thanks to my patients and to the breast team. Uh, and that concludes my presentation. Many thanks.